All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the first of our mini symposium series. So, you know, the goal of this was that we sort of surveyed a bunch of people in CIFAR for sort of. Uh, oh, great! Is this on? Do I have to? Anyway, so the goal of this was to sort of uh, we we surveyed a bunch of people across the CIFAR investigators, sort of topics and ideas that people had or want to learn more about. And so we've created this series, hopefully, to give sort of a big picture idea on uh, these various topics. And this is the first of the series uh, dealing with, essentially, missing data issues. So hopefully, you know, this will be a valuable resource to everybody in the CIFAR community. Um, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Liz Stewart to be our moderator, who will be taking over. If you can all see me, <laughs> I'll do this. Um, great. So um, Brian and Prosty are really the brains behind this whole series. And I'm just going to say a few words about missing data in particular. Oh, you know, I'm not used to PowerPoint. And it did this the other day, too, where like I didn't mean to have it. <laughs> anyway, here we go. So the format for today, we are going um, from now till 1.30. And the format is that I'm going to give like a 10 minute sort of very, very big picture introduction to kind of missing data. Uh, and then we're going to have three sort of 15 to 20 minute talks, um, which I'll get come back to in a minute. Uh, and then we'll have time for sort of Q&A and discussion at the end. And I'll try to think of some provocative questions or things, but I really encourage, I don't have anything prepared for that part. Um, and so really encourage all of you to ask the questions that are going to be relevant for your um, for your own projects and things. There's one seat here right in the front. OK, so um, I wanted to just take a couple of minutes to sort of um, kind of motivate everyone to stick around in this little room. Um, so why should you care about missing data? Um, First, I didn't put this on the slide, but almost every study that you are going to encounter will have to think about missing data in some way. And today, we're actually going to hear about some strategies for minimizing missing data, which is always better. Um, but in general, there's going to be some missingness. You have to be thoughtful about it. So why should you care? Um, first is that some of the standard sort of simple approaches, like, for example, the default things that would happen if you just run your data in Stata or SAS, like if you just run a regression. The default sorts of things that would happen or the sort of easy things to implement, things like complete case, where you just subset to the people with fully observed variables, single imputation, or something called last observation carried forward, where you just sort of assume that someone stays stable after the point in time that they drop out. All of those can lead to misleading results. And I don't have time today to like really get into why and how. Um, but that's, you know, sort of the short answer is all of the sort of really basic simple approaches are, in general will lead to incorrect results. And that can mean sort of incorrect estimates, like incorrect point estimates, but also um, incorrect standard errors and sort of resulting inferences. So you have to think about it both from a bias perspective and a variance perspective. Um, and one way to think about that, you know, as a very simple example, one problem with, say, a complete case analysis where you just drop anyone who is missing any of the variables in your analysis, you're going to end up with a much smaller analysis sample than you started, and they may not be at all kind of reflective of like the group that you actually care about. So then what are the point of methods that deal with missing data? Um, I wanted to just make this point because sometimes we're actually not going to hear a lot about multiple imputation today. but. All of the approaches can sort of, in some sense, be thought of as trying to predict what's missing. And I want to encourage you to not really think about it that way. The, the goal of procedures for handling missing data uh, aim to get good uh, inferences, sort of accurate results, so accurate parameter estimates, accurate regression coefficients, accurate effect estimates. Don't sort of think in your head, we're trying to predict what Joe's values would have been if we could have seen them. We're not really trying to think of like, I mean, we, we might sort of fill those in as a middle step, but we're not going to judge the quality of our procedure based on how well it sort of imputes or sort of predicts individual values. We're thinking about these, the methods we're going to hear about um, are sort of more about getting accurate statistical inferences sort of overall. Does that sort of make sense? And again, I, in part I say that because 
especially with things like imputation, people often are like, oh, you get very nervous about this idea of sort of imputing specific values for people. And yes, we might do that, but that's only a first step, and that's not sort of the, that's not kind of what we're going to be really using in the end. Or it, I mean, we use it, but not, it's not sort of the judge of quality. So that's sort of, you know, why should you care in sort of very big picture. But I wanted to also lay out that there's sort of, that not all missing data is the same, and we're going to hear some examples of that today. Um, but first, you know, in terms of what solutions are going to make sense, you need to think about like what variables have the missingness. Uh, is it covariates? Is it the outcomes of interest? Is it the exposure of interest? And the answer of what's going to make sense is going to depend somewhat on um, which variables are the ones you're really worried about. And like today, we're going to hear a couple of methods that really are focused on outcome missingness. Um, and so there's some tools that can be used in that context that are harder to use sort of in a more general context. The second, and I'm sort of talking about this in very vague general terms without kind of the statistical formalism, um, but just to give you the idea, the next thing to think about is what are the missingness patterns? Uh, and so what I mean by that is things like once someone drops out, do they stay gone forever or do they maybe come back? Or if these, you know, is it that we had an instrument and the whole instrument is missing for them or was it just like a few items that they didn't answer on that instrument? You need to sort of think about where, where are the holes, like where is the missingness, and then sort of what were the mechanisms that might have led to those items being missing. And so the, the monotone refers to this idea that once someone drops out, they stay out sort of forever. Um, the intermittent is one where people, yeah, sort of might come and go in terms of the missingness. Um, and then finally, and in some ways the hardest one, is um, what's really important with missing data, and again, I think we'll hear echoes of this um, in the session, uh, is what factors relate to missingness. You know, basically an, an a easy, like, generalization is that if the things that relate to missingness, so the variables that sort of predict whether someone is going to tell you their response or not, are observed, you're in good shape. And we can, we have methods like imputation or weighting that can adjust for that. And that's, uh, the official term for that is what's called missing at random. What is really a concern uh, is, when thing, is when the missingness, and therefore sort of our ideas about what the missing values might be, might depend on things we don't observe. So maybe it depends on the value itself. Maybe people who are sicker can't come into the clinic, and so the fact that they're missing is indicative of the fact that they may actually be worse than the people you actually see. Uh, and I think Becky's talk, I think, will sort of touch more on that kind of idea. Does that kind of make sense? Really briefly, um, again, this could be like a whole term long course, but I'm doing it in two minutes. Um, <laughs> what are some standard methods for handling missing data? And, uh, and again, I'm kind of going to describe this in a way to then connect with the three talks we're going to hear. Um, first is I think um, one point is it's always better, again, to minimize missingness. So there's various study designs or data sources that you can use that are going to have fewer problems of missingness. And so, Dr. Althoff will be telling us about, um, you know, using electronic health records and sort of missing this kind of means something different in that context, and, and so we'll talk about that. But you can think about designing a study in a way that tries to minimize missing this. There's other pr things that sort of start to bridge design and analysis, uh, and Dr. Jen Jenberg, Jenberg. Mm -hmm. Jenberg. Jenberg, thank you. Um, is going to give an example of something like that, where it's a smart design that's, again, trying to get at this issue of understanding the missingness in a much better way, um, and it sort of bridges design and analysis. And then finally, there's a whole spectrum of analysis strategies. strategies. Sort of once you have your data set, how do you, you know, the missingness is what it is, how do you analyze the data in the most appropriate ways? So these include things like inverse probability weighting, which is what we're going to hear about um, for like third, I guess, because I think we're going in this yeah. order. Multiple imputation, um, maximum likelihood methods, um, and all three of those fundamentally sort of, ad again, adjust for things that we have observed. So we can adjust for the variables that predict missingness or relate to missingness uh, that we observe and can account for. We're then, the, the final bullet here is just alluding to the fact that we are, then are often worried that really the people with missing values might just be different in unobserved ways. Again, they might be sicker or maybe they're healthier. Um, 
And so there was a whole suite of kind of sensitivity analysis methods that allow you to kind of assess robustness of results to those unobserved factors. Okay, so that was the super quick introduction. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick plug on like how to learn more beyond what you're going to hear today. Uh, and we can come back to some of these points probably at the end of the session. But first, I just wanted to highlight this paper. Um, so it grew out of a National Academy of Sciences panel that was put together to really think really carefully about recommendations for missing data. It has a little bit of an, of an FDA kind of focus, but um, I think the general lessons and sort of strategies are very, you know, generalizable. And this is the sort of New England Journal of Medicine summary version of the 100-page report. Um, I want to point out that a couple of Hopkins faculty are co-authors on that. I, uh, Dan Sharfstein is, and then I believe also Constantine Frangakis. So we have some nice expertise. And one of the things it really focuses on is this idea that minimizing <laughs> missing data is, of course, always better. But then they sort of give strategies for when you do still have some missingness. Um, I also wanted to just give a quick plug on Dan's behalf. Um, so Dan Sharfstein has a PCORI grant to um, develop <laughs> methods and um, pretty and sort of easy to use software to handle dropout in clinical trials. Uh, and, um, and especially when you're worried that the dropout might be due to unobserved factors. He is, would love, he actually, when he saw that I was doing this, he's like, Liz, like mention that if anyone has data <laughs> to reach out. <laughs> So um, he would love examples of clinical trials where you have a longitudinal follow-up and have dropout and want to sort of try out um, his methods. Um, so this is the website. Contact him, and he would be thrilled. Uh, and then finally, um, a plug for my own thing. I teach a one-day summer institute. Well, it's now a one-credit online summer institute course that really focuses on multiple imputation, um, but also talks about missing data sort of in general. We offered it for the first time last summer, um, so you could look for that next summer, I assume, sort of July. So um, that is back to the summary. Um, we are going to start, and yes, we're going to, I believe we're going to go in this order. So we will start with Dr. Althoff, who is going to talk about, do we have these up? Yes, looks like it's. And uh, I'll give you some warnings of uh, time. Oh, thanks. We'll what do we got, 15? Yeah. 20 total, so if you do 15, you can have a couple minutes for questions, so. Hmm. Okay, oh, great. you don't have a title. <laughs> it was on there in the, in the smaller version, but not on this one. Hmm. I love technology. Missing it's missing, <laughs> it's missing. So I am Carrie. <laughs> I'm gonna talk to you about minding the gap, um, which is uh, what I think a clever little way to think about uh, missing data, particularly in electronic medical records. Do any of you do research using electronic medical records, anybody, or claims data, or anything like that? Okay. So this is a growing phenomenon, um, particularly in the U.S., so electronic medical record systems, huge uptake, and this has been inspired by two pieces of legislation, the High Tech Act in 2009 and then the Affordable Care Act required that hospitals have electronic medical records, and so you can see this dramatic uptake in the hospitals um, that are using electronic medical records. Um, and so this data is becoming um, kind of abundant, right? So um, before I go too far down that road, I think we should all be aware that these electronic medical records are not set up to cultivate research data, right? There's a lot that goes into looking at what is an electronic <coughs> medical record and using those data in, in, for research purposes. But regardless, it's kind of this pool of information that using the right tools, you can draw data out of it and put together data sets um, for research methodology. It's really impossible to know how many exactly research studies use EMR data, but the literature is showing dramatic uptick in studies that are published using electronic medical record data, a fourfold increase from 2000 to 2007, but these were small numbers to begin with, so, you know, a twofold increase of two studies is eight studies, right? Um, and in more recent times, a twofold increase, and now we're starting to see what they think are, are studies in the hundreds that are being published using electronic medical record data. Kaiser Permanente is a huge source of this, right? So they were kind of like the first big mega group to um, give everyone electronic medical record and integrate care in that way. 
Um, I actually, full disclosure, I, I collaborate with both uh, Kaiser Permanente Northern California and KP Mid-Atlantic States. And then there are a couple of UK uh, practic practice research databases. And then the Veterans Administration, that's another huge source of electronic medical record data. So oftentimes people think of EMR data as this is great. It's kind of a cheap way to get data, right? Because it's there, we just got to figure out how to pull it out. So I would say that piece of figuring out how to pull it out has become more expensive than what I think anyone initially thought it would be. And so that's something to keep in mind. But these become powerful resources of data um, when we think about standardization and cleaning, right? So, so if you're looking for hemoglobin A1Cs and you have the name of the assay that was used to, to measure that, there, there's a lot of information that, that can quickly be um, summarized into that data set to get some standardized values as opposed to if we think about pulling different research protocols from different groups to get a pool big enough to look at rare outcomes or rare diseases. Um, you're going to have a lot of differences in measurements, timing of measurements, different things like that. Electronic medical data kind of takes some of that noise out of it. There's diagnoses, laboratory measurements, medication prescriptions, and physician notes uh, in electronic medical record data. Sometimes we think of these as more accurate than self-report if we were going to go out to a community and ask. But of course, context is important, right? So. Um, identifying someone with diabetes in an electronic medical record, there are algorithms you can use that are going to be a little bit more specific and sensitive than identifying someone with nicotine dependence, right? So who's a smoker, are they current, are they former, the intensity of smoking? That kind of information is harder to gleam from a medical record. So really the best elements that come out of the electronic med medical record are biometric and laboratory data. Um, there's usually longitudinal follow-up available, right? Your electronic medical record is supposed to be following you through time. And sometimes these electronic medical records get linked to other databases like cancer registries and different things like that. And then you, you have this opportunity to validate an outcome like cancer or something in the medical record using a registry. Our focus um, in a group that I work a lot with is complete capture of events. So I use the term events and not outcome or exposure because events can be outcomes and exposures. They could be covariates if you're in a research risk factor analysis framework. So it's essentially anything that is kind of, this is the time point at which we think this disease process was recognized, right? So capture of, of these events can be, um, can have issues that are that are really systematic and some of the things that I'll talk about today a switch from paper to electronic medical records right so when you're looking in data and there's that switch um, you have some issues that arise there that are completely systematic based on the time of that switch changes in hardware or software systems so across the street we use the epic program um, changes in software or hardware to the epic program can result in changes in the data that are in the record, where they are in the record, how that affects your algorithms, different things like that. There can also be changes to the algor algorithms for abstracting the data, such as changes to diagnosis codes. The ICD-9 to 10 transition was like a disaster. Um, in terms of pulling out research information, you have to do all the crosswalks and make sure you have all of that information. So there are a lot of pitfalls where things can go systematically wrong in the capture of information from electronic medical records. So the question we kind of consistently pose to ourselves is, here we kind of create this false comfort assumption that everything is in your electronic medical record, right? And therefore, if you don't have a diagnosis of something, we can make the assumption that you do not have a clinically recognized disease, right? And that's what we push on, is that assumption, right? Because that assumption means you have complete capture in the electronic medical records. So how do we push on that assumption? We've uh, come to this methodology that we call observation windows. So real quick, I have to differentiate what's the difference between a single study and a collaborative study, because I'm going to show you some um, data visualization tools and methods that we use. But you have to be using them at the smallest unit of measure for your study in terms of where those electronic medical record data's are, data information is coming from. So a single EMR study could be something like, you go over to the Hopkins HIV clinical cohort and they pull their data from the Hopkins system over here and it's, it's one clinical cohort. Um, Multi-site studies are something like the HIV Research Network. So this is one study and they try and pull everything systematically but they're pulling them from different hospital EMRs 
all over the country. And then we have the NA Accord. The NA Accord then takes both JHHCC, that clinical single site study, and HIVRN, the multi site, you know, I think there are 12 or 13 sites from HIVRN that we have, and we try and push all of that data together. So when we create observation windows, we have to create it at the smallest unit available for the single site cohort studies. It is that single site for the multi site, it's within each site that we look at these. Um, different observation windows. And just a quick plug for the NA Accord, if you're looking to do some research, we invite all investigators, potential investigators, to seek us out. We have quite a bit, over a million years of follow-up time. We follow people for a median of five years. Some people we've now been following for 15 plus years. We have almost 35,000 recorded deaths, and that's um, matched to National Death Index. And the median age at death is, is 50, and it's, it's growing. So our population is, is definitely getting older. They're, they're living uh, longer lives with HIV. The example I'm going to use is diabetes occurrence. So I use the term occurrence because this is not a measurement of disease onset. This is a measurement of clinical recognition of diabetes, OK? So we created this operationalized definition of diabetes type 2 of a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5% or diabetes-specific medication prescription. So we have a list of specific medicines that are really only used for diabetes purposes. And then we have diabetes diagnosis and a related medication. So some medications aren't used just for diabetes. So if we see you have a diagnosis and that related medication. So if you fit any one of these three bullets, we're going to say you've had a diabetes occurrence, and we're going to look at when you fit that bullet and say that's the time from which you have clinically recognized diabetes. So when we want to try and create an observation window, first we're going to take metadata. That's the information at the site level, not the individual level, the site level. And we're going to think about dates and calendar time. We're going to think about date of the clinical cohort's establishment, so the time from which we're following people in that clinical cohort, the time that we end that following, and we're going to look at the switch um, from paper to EMR because a lot of our studies go back. And we create, we've used this big data visualization tool that I call the spreadsheet histogram. So these are just numbers of observations. This is for one cohort. Diabetes related, related medication start dates because you know the date that they were initially prescribed, the date that that prescription ended. We have that for the specific medications as well, then our diagnoses and our hemoglobin A1C measurements. So I'm just looking at where my data are in calendar time, right? So this is the start of the cohort up here. Back in 1997, this is the end, and it's not a full year here. It's about 7, 5. Ooh, don't touch it. It's about 7, 5, or um, you notice I use calendar time in decimal dates, right? So like 0.75 is September of that year type of a thing. And I'm just looking to see where my data are, and I notice this is when there's a switch in the electronic from paper to electronic medical records, so you start to see the data getting bigger. We also need to remember that people were not living long enough to get diabetes back in, in these, these years. It really starts coming on here where people are aging with HIV. We look at each data element, the minimum and the maximum start dates, to try and figure out when are we actually getting this information that we're using in our algorithms. And from that, we then go to our definition, our algorithm here, and we create a diabetes observation start window and a diabetes observation stop window. That's the period of time where we believe we have complete data on the data elements needed for our definition. If we don't have complete capture of those uh, data elements, we're going to assume that person is not with diabetes, but really that's just missing data, right? So we're making a false assumption here. So this blue box becomes our observation window, the time during which we believe this cohort is capturing uh, diabetes information in a way that we can actually uh, uh, take some comfort in better capture, com nearly complete ascertainment, because there's not anything that's perfect ascertainment. So then what we do is we visualize the black bars are the cohort start and stop dates. The blue bars are, is that blue box for each cohort. This is when we're looking and have complete capture of the diabetes information. And these yellow pieces are the time frames when, if we add person time in an incidence rate analysis, for example, if we add in this person time when we're not fully capturing diagnoses, we're going to underestimate our incidence rate, right? We're going to get a wrong um, estimate. And we, we showed this with this specific example that we actually see 
on the attenuation because essentially we have immortal person time in there, right? When they can't be getting the diagnosis because we don't have complete ascertainment. Um, and then it increases when we kind of squish that time into the right time frames where we're getting better ascertainment. So the take home message is this, design should not be ignored when addressing electronic medical record as the New England Journal article states. Like try your best, do everything you can, even if you don't get to pick exactly where your data comes from. This is all a part of your exploratory data analysis. Where are your data coming from? In time, from place, different things like that. Use your epi skills to um, make sure your design is, is solid. So please do reach out if you're interested in the NA Accord. Go to this website. We have a lot of data up there that shows kind of CD4 coming out presentation and ART initiation and viral loads and stuff over time because we monitor all of that um, and, and collaborate with the CDC and the NIH and all this other stuff. So please do come and contact us if you're interested. Um, we'll teach you lots of fun stuff. Any questions? That's a whirlwind. That methodology literally took like five years to develop <laughs> in 15 minutes. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll um, we'll see if there's questions in a second. But um, I want to expand on what you said because I think one way to think of what Carrie presented is that in some sense with EHR data, EMR data, sometimes you might think you have less missingness than you really have. And like, you know, sort of fundamentally the issue there is you might have someone who you think is a zero and really it's that <coughs> Zero, but because it's actually missing, and so like it requires this careful thought about well, first we need to think about could we have observed it and set up this whole procedure to figure that out, and then you can think more carefully around what's what's a true missing and what's a true zero. There were a couple questions. Very great talk. Um, I was just curious when, when people were starting with the electronic data capture. I mean, it's, it has to not be perfect at first, so. I'm assuming that there's some sort of surveillance bias maybe at the <coughs> beginning of the observation windows, and I was just wondering if you guys investigated that and how you dealt with it. So we actually, um, so this is an HIV cohort, so we, the cohorts kind of have their start date, right? When they got funding to start pulling all their data together, and a lot of this was like, I need funding to go to LabQuest and they're gonna send me these data, and then I'm going to pay for somebody to abstract basic date of birth and different things like that. So they work to pull these things together. The electronic medical record process made that all a lot smoother. So what we did was identify core elements of HIV disease, so C4 is viral loads. And we did this observation window process on it, and we said, this is when the cohort starts, when their funding starts. This is when the NA Accord believes observation is complete. And when we did that, almost all of the windows switched to the electronic medical record start date, right? Because you see the better capture at that time. Um, so that's one way that we've kind of worked around that, that uh, bias in the transition from the paper to the electronic medical record. Because you're right, there are things that are falling through the cracks a lot of times then that you know we're going to see just slightly later. The other thing that's nice with these HIV cohorts, many of them have been established since the late 90s, right? That's when a lot of these got established. But in HIV now, most of our studies are from 2000, because even 2000 is now 17 years worth of data, right? So we really focus most of what we do in the modern ART era, which is a time point after which the electronic medical record was safely in place. So we don't have as much um, pitfall in our data from, from that transition time. So you don't feel like in the beginning of the electronic medical capture there were issues in reporting really? It's like after the switch occurred, it seemed to be pretty good. After the switch occurred, we see a lot more consistency in terms of just our rates over time. So, you know, it's not just looking at these observation windows. It's then going, you know, three or four steps further. What do the rates look like over time? What does the prevalence look like over time? And making sure all things are trending with the way that other data are showing or the way that we, we think um, and our clinicians tell us it's what they're seeing. I just have a question, like when you merge the um, data sets, is it on like, a person and you have all that complete information or is it like different names at one hospital and like one research clinic? So it is it is an individual level harmonized approach. Um, so we are the EpiBioStat core here. There's a data management and harmonization core at the University of Washington, Seattle. Mm -hmm. So they have protocols and mechanisms 
The cohorts upload their data in a standardized protocol. They do one level of harmonization. It comes to us. We do a cleaning level of harmonization as well, and then we put together analytic-ready data sets. So then you design your study and you pull from the analytic-ready data sets to create your individual study population and data set. So yeah, individual level. It's a lot of data. I think we have like 4 million viral loads now. I mean, it's a lot of data. It's a lot of data. Thanks to the CIFAR for the invitation to um, present this work today. Um, I'll, I'll be talking about another case where um, a lack of a data point in, in your data set um, could mean either that the outcome did not exist or that it was missing. Um, and so I think it's a nice segue from, from Carrie's talk. Um, so uh, I'll be discussing using double sampling to estimate linkage to HIV care in Western Kenya. I want to start by acknowledging um, my collaborators, particularly those um, in Kenya at Moi University, um, Judy Washira and Samson Ndenge, um, as well as Joe Hogan um, and Yijin Zhu at Brown, who really um, provided the statistical uh, work behind this um, analysis. So I want to start just by giving some context here for, for situating this work within um, the larger dialogue um, about uh, the HIV care cascade. As you all know, this is a really useful conceptual framework that's used very widely now to um, detail the steps with which a person who is living with HIV would need to go through in order to achieve viral suppression. Typically starts with diagnosis, followed by linking to care, initiating ERT, staying in care over time, adhering to ERT, and then um, uh, achieving viral suppression. Um, this is just an update on how we're doing from the most recent UNAIDS report in Eastern and Southern Africa, um, and it's all geared towards the goal put out by UNAIDS in 2014 of 90-90-90, which is something I'm sure you've all heard a lot about which is that um, by the year 2020, UNAIDS would like us all to have 90% um, of the people living with HIV on the globe diagnosed, 90% of those um, initiated ART, and 90% of those virally suppressed. And so um, thinking in this framework, um, you can see how those targets present challenges both at the measurement level for those of us who are interested in data as well as, of course, for patients who are, um, need to go through these various steps in order to get to viral suppression. Um, so you can see in Eastern and Southern Africa, we have quite a ways to go to reach those 90-90-90 targets. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about how um, often these 90-90-90 targets are used at regional um, or national levels to um, evaluate how well we're doing at reaching um, those goals. Um, but there is really limited data on that first step in the care cascade in the first, um, in the segueing the first 90 to the second 90, which is that diagnosis into initiation of ART. Often you see that this data is coming from facility-based measures, and by that I mean that um, facilities where testing is offered um, or care is offered, um, they follow those who, who show up, who get tested, who get diagnosed, and then follow them through to see if they get into care. What we lack, I think, pretty much in most settings around the world is data from the population level. So if we really wanted to estimate that first 90 of all of those living with HIV who were diagnosed, we'd need to have population level data, right? We'd need to know everyone living in a country who has HIV, how many of those have been diagnosed. Um, so this really does limit our ability to measure progress towards these goals. So what we um, sought to do was to um, take advantage of a home-based counseling and testing program in Western Kenya, which went door to door. So this essentially gives us a nice denominator for estimating some of these targets at a population-based level. Um, but the other piece of data that's often lacking is that we, when we do see estimates of linkage to care following diagnosis, we often don't know what happened to the people who didn't link to care. Um, and so there's a very small amount of data out in the world right now on, on the outcomes of those people who fa fail to come to care after they're diagnosed. And so we wanted to kind of fill that gap um, using, uh, and I appreciate the, the clever, <laughs> using a clever approach here, um, which is to go back and collect more data go back and find people who were diagnosed who didn't link to care and then see what their outcomes were. So this approach has been used really successfully by um, Elvin Gang, among others, um, 
uh, in various settings in sub-Saharan Africa to correct mortality estimates for patients who were in HIV care and were lost. So we wanted to apply a similar method um, to patients who were diagnosed who did not link to care. So again, our objective then is to estimate linkage um, to an engagement in HIV care as well as mortality among adults who were newly diagnosed with HIV in three re regions of Western Kenya. So this work is in collaboration with the AMPATH Consortium. AMPATH stands for the Academic Model Providing Access to Healthcare. My former institution, Brown University, is a member of the AMPATH Consortium. Um, it's located in Eldoret, Kenya, and it's made up of over a dozen uh, North American, that's both American as well as Canadian, institutions, um, academic institutions, as well as teaching um, and referral hospitals that are point, uh, partnered with Moy University School of Medicine and Teaching and Referral Hospital, which is based in Eldoret. Um, and this is a PEPFAR-funded um, HIV treatment program, which is one of the largest um, in Eastern Africa. They've treated um, over 180,000 people with free HIV and TB care since 2001. Um, and they have a tripartite mission of service, training, and research. As a part of their program, they conducted home-based counseling and testing. So they went out to seven of their catchment areas and have been offering since 2007 door-to-door -door home-based counseling and testing um, to everyone who, who lives in the region. So they've successfully tested 98% um, of people who were, who were eligible and reached well over a million individuals um, with this effort. And again, what this allows us to do is to see within a community what, um, what happens to all of those who are diagnosed. So the trick is, of course, how do we figure out who engages in care? We go, we visit them, we test them, we diagnose them, and then what happens? Well, what we thought we, we would try to do is to use um, a method where we combine that population level data with medical records data within AMPATH to see, okay, how many of those who were diagnosed actually showed up and came for care? The assumption being that AMPATH is the majority care provider in the area, so we would assume that the majority of people would come um, to AMPATH to receive HIV care if they were to enroll in care. There are some people who do seek care elsewhere, um, and, we're, and we acknowledge that, um, but we're not accounting for that um, necessarily in this analysis. So what we did was we used an algorithm that was validated by the Reagan Streif Institute, which is affiliated with Indiana University, to combine these two data sources. So we have the um, population-based data, home-based counseling and testing. We merged that with our medical records data and tried to match, um, similar to what Carrie was just discussing, um, individual to individual. And as a result of that effort, um, we saw that 12% of those people who were diagnosed with HIV at the time of uh, home-based counseling and testing who were not engaged in care at the time of the test linked to care within four years. Sorry, this is a typo here. It's, it should say um, June 2014. So the home-based counseling and testing took place in 2010, and then we looked four years later to see of those who were diagnosed how many showed up for care. Um, we do get a nice um, split population here of, of people who were diagnosed who um, reported that they were engaged in care, so we can kind of see, okay, this is one group who um, is engaged in care at the time of the test. We kind of ignore those for the purposes of this analysis. We're interested in people who were diagnosed and not in care at the time of the test, and then looked forward to see did they engage in care over time. So we got this estimate of 12%. So the problem, of course, is that we don't know then of those who, um, uh, we don't know the status of those who didn't engage in care in AMPATH going forward. So what we wanted to do was to um, get additional data on that group. On that group. Um, but we couldn't go to every single person who had been tested positive and did not engage in care. The resources involved in that would be um, quite large. So we selected a 10% random sample of people who, according to our records, um, who were newly diagnosed and not engaged in care um, uh, as of the point at which we looked at our data, which was mid-2015. One additional step that we did after we did the um, medical record review in 2014 using that algorithm, we, um, we looked at all the probable cases. So this algorithm gives you confident um, certain matches, and then it gives you a range of people who are considered potential matches. For the purposes of the original analysis, we decided to call those not matched, so not engaged in care. We then spent the next year or more um, going through each of those cases one by one to see if we relaxed the criteria. Could we maybe see if there were potential matches there um, that we did not account for initially in the data? Um, so 
after all of that work, we had this group of people who we believed did not come for care. We wanted to know what was their status. So we had trained field workers go and visit um, households of this 10% uh, random sample that we selected to confirm their status um, and to first see if, were they living. Um, if they were living, were they engaged in care? And if they were not engaged in care, what were the reasons why they weren't? And then we were used, what we, what we um, sought to do was to use that additional data to estimate the probability of linkage among all of those who we did not find as a process of this data merge. Okay. So what we did was we selected this 10% random sample of people from, from Port Victoria who were um, considered not linked to care in our initial analysis. And then because we had limited resources, we wanted to then apply those estimates to these two other catchments which were nearby and similar um, within the AMPATH catchment area. Okay, so from these original estimates of those that we found um, who, hadn't, who were not engaged in care at the time of the test, um, and then we did our initial review over the probable cases, we found 32% of those had linked to care. Um, and then we selected our 10% random sample of those who we believed had not engaged in care um, <coughs> following that test, that initial test. And again, what, what the goal was, was to then apply estimates from those who were selected and found to make some inference on the larger group of people who had not engaged in care. Um, the difference here between the orange box and the yellow box is, of course, we selected a 10% sample, but we might not necessarily be able to locate all of those people who we selected. So really, we're using the yellow box here, which is all of those who we were able to actually find um, to make inference about the population um, who is not engaged in care. And so again, um, what we, what we um, sought to do was to impute the outcome probabilities for those who were missing their linkage status here in this example, that's just R0. So we have this group of people who we know are linked to care, um, and then we have unknown um, linkage status for all of the um, people who we could not identify through the data merge process. Then we used some bootstrap techniques to uh, obtain an over overall distribution for each of the outcomes that were possible among that group of people who we selected and identified. So they were either linked to care within or outside of AMPATH. Um, they were not linked to care at all. So they had not engaged in HIV care at all since their test or um, they had died. Okay. So here are the results. Um, and I apologize for some reason the ends got um, removed from this graph, from this table. Um, but what we found was that those who we randomly selected from within Port Victoria really reflected the overall population um, characteristics within, um, within the catchment. So there was some good, um, there was a good representation, we believe, in that, in that um, the people we randomly selected represented those people who were living in um, Port Victoria. Um, and then we, again, we were, go were going to use that information we gained from those 10% random selected to make some inference about um, Chilambo and Teso as well, which are these two other geographic regions. So here's what we found. Um, so when we did that um, second round of review of probable cases, again, we found in Port Victoria, 32% we believed had engaged in care. In Chilambo and Teso, we did the same thing and found similar estimates. Then when we applied the data from our double sampling, um, these estimates go up dramatically. So um, if we take the information that we gained from this uh, additional group of people, we see that linkage to care actually ranges from about 55 to 60 percent. Okay, and that's within AMPATH. We also asked them if, if they were engaged in care in another setting. So we have a, um, you know, between 14 and 17 percent who reported seeking care elsewhere. Um, and then uh, around 15 to 16 percent who said that they hadn't had not engaged in care at all since their test, um, and then um, between 10 and 13 uh, percent who had died since the time of their test. So what we concluded from all of this uh, information is that there is, a, there is potentially a large amount of misclassification and error in our data merging methods that we need to account for very carefully um, if we are going to use them to make um, inference about engagement and care in, in, in this setting, and in any setting really where we're combining um, two data sets um, using potentially uh, information that may not be so reliable. Um, 
There is no national unique identifying number used within Kenya that we could easily sort of, no social security number that we can use <laughs> to just kind of match numbers to numbers. Um, so um, those pieces of information that get put into that algorithm might ne not necessarily yield the best um, results in terms of um, combining data sets. Um, I say there's a need for health system strengthening here because um, if we had uh, data systems that um, allowed for those unique identifiers to be in place across data sy systems within the healthcare system, um, as well as potentially efforts that are out in communities um, collecting data at a population level, um, this, this work would be a lot easier to accomplish. Um, and then this may seem like a very random thing to have on this slide. Stigma continues to be a pervasive issue. I'll tell you why I say that. What we discovered as we asked people um, who we did find, um, you know, who said that they were engaged in care in AMPATH, well, we wanted to understand, like, well, why didn't we find you in our data set? And what they told us is that they used different names. Um, when they came to register, they went to different um, facilities, which just was a little bit complicated for us in terms of trying to make a match. You know, we didn't want to assume someone who, is, who sought care 100 miles away was the same person, um, but they said that they did that sort of intentionally to um, avoid seeing people that they knew. Um, so there are a lot of sort of other challenges that um, the data doesn't necessarily speak to that we need to take account for here when we're um, trying to use these types of methods to uh, make any statement about engagement and care um, using these sorts of data sets. So I think I'll stop there and um, take any questions now or after. Yeah. Um, so I have a quick question about yeah. that. So with the individuals who decided not to engage in care, was there any relationship with how um, long of time had passed between their tests and the current time? Like is, um, yeah. Would they just, would it be like a more recent thing and didn't think that it was as necessary or something like further in the past that they just weren't feeling really sick? Yeah, I'll say yes to both of those okay. things. Um, what we found is that those people who did link to care tended to link fairly quickly, and by that I mean within 90 days. Um, I think about 75% of, of the people who we did find um, in the data set, um, in the medical records, um, had linked within 90 days of their test. Um, but that sort of accounts for maybe a really motivated group, um, or maybe a group that's experiencing symptoms and sort of has a, has a, feels the need to come for care. We did some qualitative work um, to go back and ask people who hadn't engaged in care, like what their reasons were. Um, and it's, it's complicated, but yes, one of, the, one of the themes that we've heard a lot is, well, it's not a priority, I've got other stuff going on, I'm not sick, I'm well, I'm okay, I'll go when I need to go, meaning I'll go when I get sick, um, because that's sort of, when I'll be able to um, fit it into, you know, it'll be it'll be urgent at that point. Um, so, so I think there's a mix of things going on. There's sort of different groups of people here um, and have different reasons for seeking care, and that's all kind of part of what we're trying to uncover. So that you know, the ultimate goal is to um, change the way that the program runs so that we capture all people um, as much as we possibly can to get them engaged in care so that they can get on ART as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what are the next steps? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, we have to dig into this data more um, and do a little more, um, trying to understand uh, a little bit more about, like, well, well, is it okay to apply the estimates from this tiny sample of people who we were able to, um, to find um, to this larger um, proportion of people who didn't engage in care. We're sort of going back again to our data merge um, and, and just reviewing that and then trying to re-estimate, um, incorporating uh, a little bit more uncertainty into those estimates than we did before. Um, and um, the other thing that we continue to do is to, is to try to um, push for harmonization of data across systems. Because um, really that's like the main challenge here is that we really kind of wouldn't even need to have done this had the systems been able to talk to each other. Um, so that's just another thing. And then addressing stigma, of course, is a, is a challenging one, but um, having people be able to register and receive care under different names, like there's no way we can get around that from a data or measurement perspective, but um, we feel like if we work on the stigma aspects, people will be then less likely to, to take those, those approaches when, when they are going for care. So. 
And it's just, it's a reduced stigma. And it's just a reduced stigma general, of course. What's the last question? Okay. So did you consider, or would you consider, applying your linkage algorithm to the people that you found in your original survey that they were engaged in care as like a much we less did. resource intensive way of so the difference with that group, okay, so when we went and we tested and people said, oh yeah, I know I'm positive, I'm actually in care, here's my card, they showed us their number, like their, their um, enrollment number in the care system, so they were really easy to match um, because they had that sort of hard, you know, link. Yeah. Um, but we did, we did um, also apply the algorithm to those people. And um, there, was, there was some slight error, but it's not as bad as, as um, as what we found with those who did not engage in care. And so we have to dig into that a little bit more to see, well, what, what is it about this group? Like there, must, there may be something to explain why the match isn't working um, as well. But I think the issue of stigma is a really tricky one, because if you're using a different name, there's no way we're going to be able to put your records together. Um, so that's kind of a challenging piece of the story. Thank you. One connection as we switch, um, you know, this was in a descriptive um, epidemiologic kind of. I've seen double sampling used also in, in trials where people are really worried about outcome missingness and worried that the people who are not in the sample at the end are just different. And in a trial context, that can cause a lot of trouble. So um, you can use the same sorts of ideas um, in this other context as well. Okay, so our final speaker is Derek. From the Department of Epidemiology. <laughs> uh, and he's going to now talk about now, in sort of more in the scenario where you don't have all these resources to actually go do more data collection. Um, so, what do you do when you just have a data set in front of you? Yeah, so thank you so much for, uh, for, for having me today. Um, this is going to be quite a, a, a different uh, talk, I think, than the, than the last two. We're talking about big data and, and big communities you know, countrywide surveillance, that sort of thing. And we're going to go into some biomarkers and uh, some interesting um, effects on biomarkers by a uh, particular uh, medication that's used for, um, used as part of antiretroviral therapy, and that's cobicistat. And I'm going to be talking about how it has a deceptive uh, effect on kidney function. And then presenting an application of inverse probability of censoring weights um, to deal with uh, less data um, that was contributed by people who received that particular therapy compared to those who, who didn't. Um, so we all know that uh, ART is um, uh, uh, very effective at, at controlling the replication of, of, uh, of HIV in the, in, in the body. Um, and, that, uh, HIV, and that ART also has some costs on, on kidney function. And kidney function is absolutely critical for properly uh, clinically managing um, HIV infection. Um, and the reason for that is that there are um, ART medications that are nephrotoxic, that actually damage the kidney. Um, uh, another component is that um, as the kidney filters the blood and clears out, um, clear, clears out the therapy, um, that determines how much therapy is in the system. So it can influence the bioavailability of these, uh, of these therapies. And then it's also important to identify complications that may be uh, arising from the therapy or the, the disease course. HIV does infect the, the, the kidney organ itself. Um, so I'm also a big fan of the kidney. I do a lot of kidney research, and um, it's just uh, absolutely crucial for, for management. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is, is, uh, is improve the health overall of, of uh, people infected with HIV. And measuring kidney function is, is, uh, is critical to that, uh, to that end. So very quickly, um, I'm going to give you like a 30-second um, uh, primer on, on kidney function. Uh, so the, the, the kidney is the filtering uh, organ of the, uh, of the body. And the blood go goes in through the, I don't know if the pointer goes in through here, and it's filtered in um, a structure called the glomerulus. And the rate at which the blood is filtered is called the glomerular filtration rate. Um, we can estimate that by serum creatinine. It's difficult to measure it directly. Um, it takes a five-hour protocol. There's chemicals involved. There's multiple blood samples. But 
uh, some very smart nephrologists and lab scientists said, you know, we can estimate this using a biomarker that's, that's cleared um, by uh, the, the, the kidney and is specifically filtered by uh, the glomerulus. Um, what's, uh, uh, the, the, the challenge comes in the context of ART is that uh, serum creatinine secretion can be disrupted by, by this therapy. So at this, at this point here where serum creatinine should be secreted into the tubules so that you can uh, eliminate it through the urine, um, instead it remains in the body. So the higher uh, levels of serum creatinine you have, the, the, the lower your estimated GFR and the worse it is. It means your body's not filtering uh, the blood as quickly as it should. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, cobicistat is one such medication that disrupts uh, serum creatinine clearance. So this becomes a challenge when clinicians are trying to monitor uh, someone receiving this therapy. Um, uh, an, an analogy that I came up with was that it's, it's kind of like when you're driving in the car and you have the radio on and then on the radio there's a police siren and you like freeze up and you say, oh my gosh, what is it? But then you realize it's, it's nothing, it's innocuous, it's just on the radio. Um, there's uh, good evidence that, that this is a benign change, right? It doesn't, uh, it, it, it's not an indicator of actual underlying kidney function, but it more masks or, or deceives um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the kidney function by this, this change in the biomarker. So is everyone kind of clear on that? This is just critical for this uh, analysis. So cobicistat is increasing in use. The, the, the first uh, approval, I think, was around 20, 2011 or 2012, um, and uh, more medications are using it because it's really good. It's a boosting medication, so it enhances the effects of antiretroviral therapies. It doesn't have any actual antiretroviral uh, mechanism on its own. Um, but it does enhance, uh, enhance um, the effects of the antiretrovirals, and you, you may recognize some of these names. Um, so it was in the context of evaluating the uh, efficacy of these therapies that this effect was discovered, that um, it boosts the, the serum creatinine levels without actually changing the underlying uh, kidney function. Um, the problem was that the RCTs were under very carefully controlled conditions um, over a relatively short period of time. So two, uh, up to two, uh, starting at about two weeks, up to, up to 48 weeks. Um, and uh, we don't really know so much what happens to, to EGFR when clinicians use these, these measurements. So under regular clinical care, what happens? And then what happens at a longer duration among these men who are using it in common use rather than uh, under tightly controlled uh, RCTs. So the study objective was to characterize how cobicistat um, uh, affects uh, EGFR and whether it modifies trajectories of EGFR over time. Um, so our study population were ART experienced men with HIV, so these are men who are on therapy already and then they, they switch on to a cobicistat regimen. Um, and uh, the exposure was you're treated or you're untreated. The outcome was uh, estimated GFR based on serum creatinine, which as I, as I hammered home to you, this is what cobicistat um, uh, uh, affects in, in the system. Um, and then uh, we, we used a generalized estimating equation model for longitudinal analysis. So the data, the, the, the data came from the, the MAX study, which is the multi-center AIDS cohort study, and I, I presume many of you uh, know, know about this study, but it, it involves four sites across the country uh, of men with HIV and at risk for infection. But as I mentioned before, these, uh, for this analysis, we restricted only to those who were infected um, and receiving therapy. And this is a classical uh, longitudinal uh, uh, epidemiologic cohort study in which uh, men come at regular time points and a standardized protocol is given to them and that includes laboratory measurements uh, in which creatinine uh, and the estimated GFR is measured and also the reported uh, uh, therapy use. So this is a sort of a simplified uh, uh, contribution of say one, one example participant where they don't report using cobicistat at what I call visit zero um, but then uh, at the next visit, they say, yes, I'm, I'm using cobicistat, and they continue on as we observe them. 
And uh, what's so powerful about this study is that we have estimated GFR at all these time points. And we, and we know the time at which they occurred, so we can implement a longitudinal uh, uh, analysis to the data. Um, so uh, one of the, uh, the challenges we had was to try to come up with two comparable groups, one who received <coughs> the therapy and one who didn't. Um, the, uh, uh, so we, we implemented a, uh, 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 an eligibility criteria nested within the MAX, so they're already participating, and we said, okay, we, we have select criteria of, of men we think would be at risk of starting cystat, but didn't, and that's the, the 743 there. And then we have those who initiated Kobe Sista. Um, and you can see that the, the age was about 50, uh, on average, uh, 54, 53. Um, about two thirds were, were black race, and uh, they had similar distributions of body mass index, so about the same size. Um, there were some differences by HIV status. So those who initiated Kobe Sista, um, they're uh, having a, a nadir uh, CD4 that was quite low. Was, was less, about 54% with the CD4 of 350 versus 62%. Um, and they were more likely to have a detectable viral load at that visit zero. Um, and they were also more likely to be exposed to first, or less likely to be exposed to first generation uh, uh, antiretroviral therapy. And had, uh, had a shorter duration of, uh, of time on heart. Any questions so far? Um, so this is what we found when we uh, compared um, the, uh, the GFR level at the time of uh, the time prior to initiating Kobe cystat and then when they started Kobe cystat. And for those that initiated Kobe cystat prior to them initiating, so this was right before they uh, received the therapy, uh, their level was about 90, which is a very good level. That's the, that, that was the average level. But then they came back and said, oh, by the way, I've started uh, this medication co called Kobe Sistat, and uh, we look at their GFR when, when in that, in, at that visit, and it's 82. So this went down uh, eight points. And you may say, well, what does that mean? You know, is that, is that good, is that bad? So the eight point decline was over a time period of less than six months, and the in healthy individuals, we would expect on average about one point loss per year, so per 12 months. So this went down eight, eight points in less than six months. So just, you know, an absolute plummet. This is the, the siren on the radio um, that, would, that, that would worry a clinician to say, you know, my goodness, is this some sort of kidney injury? You know, what's going on here? Um, when we compared those levels for those who were already receiving therapy but didn't switch but were likely or, or were at least at risk of being switched to Kobe Sista, the, the levels were, were essentially unchanged between those two. So hopefully this convinces you that, you know, Kobe Sista really does have this, have this effect on, on serum creatinine. Fortunately, there's some evidence to say that it's not harmful, that this is more of a benign effect. But the methodologic challenge we had was then, say, uh, looking at uh, changes over time. So we're interested also in, in longitudinal changes. Um, and uh, what we found um, was that uh, uh, those who started Kobe Sistat were less likely co to contribute um, uh, more uh, to, to contribute lo longer durations of data under, under the study. So this graph shows the years since treatment initiation on the x-axis, and then the uh, proportion contributing data. And you can see that um, by 50 uh, 50 percent of, of people initiating Kobe Sistat. Um, contributed about one year of data or so. Um, but for those that didn't initiate Kobe Sistat, that was uh, closer to uh, two years. So these people uh, had contributed more data, and that made us a little uncomfortable because we said, you know, um, uh, are those people different? You know, are the people that were really interested in looking at the effect of, are they contributing less because they're sicker or maybe they're healthier? Um, and uh, uh, you, know, you know what's what's going on. Um, so we, we we looked at what is uh, related to, to this censoring, this this problem of of having less data, um, and we found other things like older age and longer duration of ART, uh, African American race, and, and having a detectable viral load. So 
the, the tool that we, we used to address this was called uh, inverse probability of censoring weights. And there are other tools uh, that one could use, but this was what we uh, selected. Um, and the idea behind this is to model the probabilities of remaining in the study based on covariates. And has anyone here heard of inverse probability of exposure weights or IPWs? Good. So, some people. Um, but it's, uh, it's similar to, to that tool, which is used for confounding. But this is uh, uh, to, to handle um, uh, selection bias or uh, differential um, uh, uh, censoring. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the process um, involves upweighting those who remained in the study to represent those who prematurely exited. And it's to create a pseudo-population of, uh, of individuals that um, uh, never actually dropped out. And uh, uh, I, I put this uh, recommended reading. Um, Dr. Lau is a co-author on that. Uh, paper and it's a wonderful paper and even more importantly it provides code for how to actually implement this in an analysis so I encourage you to look at that if you're going to use this application. Um, so here's a, an example of two uh, participants one who who was part of our treatment group uh, receiving Kobe cystat and one uh, uh, one person who didn't initiate Kobe cystat um, and how these uh, how these uh, weights uh, operate in an analytic setting. So on the, x, on the x axis we have uh, the, the time from um, uh, time from initiation uh, and then the longitudinal uh, the longitudinal data of each individual. So if you remember those two box plots that we that, that I presented to you, one being 90 and the other one being 82, the the 90 con uh, th this data point contributes to the 90. This is before they report using Kobe Sistat and then after they uh, report using Kobe Sistat. And we're interested mainly in the trajectories. How do these change over time? Um, and you'll also notice that the, um, the size of the bubble represented by each data point is different um, as, uh, as people, um, as, as data is contributed. And this is a typical person who contributed only three data points uh, just after uh, one year, and they have uh, a lot of voice to uh, to contribute to the data. This is the upweighting that we talked about. Um, for the individual who didn't start, they contribute a lot of data, and uh, uh, we worry that the that the voice that they contribute, if we don't apply the weights, would overwhelm that of the people who didn't contribute a whole lot of data. Um, so you'll notice that the data points, as they get further on, are smaller because they're downweighted. They're not contributing as much analytically to the uh, to the um, uh, to the model. So what we found um, was uh, to, uh, to 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 show you to try to quantify the average change per year um, in a in a naive estimate. Um, those who didn't receive Kobe Sistat declined about 1.8% per year, um, and those who, uh, who initiated Kobe cystat declined maybe a bit faster, 2.3%. Uh, um, that, uh, that wasn't statistically different, but uh, we think that it's important to, to compare these just to provide some context for uh, the longitudinal data. When we adjusted for confounders, there was a greater separation, indicating that, you know, um, uh, maybe those uh, people, uh, or, or it's a more valid estimate that to adjust for the confounders of, of interest. And then uh, you can see what happens when we adjust for the, the, the censoring problem. Um, they were basically the same, indicating that probably the sicker people were contributing uh, to the data uh, more than the, than the healthy people. Um, and you could imagine if you're sicker, you're more likely to, to participate in the study and uh, if you're healthier, you feel fine. You may not feel the need to, to go in uh, to uh, undergo these protocols. Um, but then when we implemented both the confounders and the censoring, there was a little bit of separation. There may be some indication that those receiving Kobe cystat was a little bit greater, but it really wasn't that, um, uh, it, it wasn't statistically different, but um, interesting to note. Um, so just to conclude, uh, I demonstrated to you that uh, those who initiated Kobe cystat decreased um, their GFR almost immediately by about 4%, and this was in uh, adjusted analyses or uh, standardized an uh, analyses, um, and that 
initiating didn't actually change the trajectories over time, but just lowered where you start at. Um, we use this, this tool of uh, inverse probability of censoring weights to account for the uh, informative dropout. Um, and, uh, and, and then, similar to the other uh, presenters, um, I'd like to highlight the MAX study that made all this uh, possible. Um, it's, a, it's an ongoing study that has a lot of data collected since 1984. Um, it uh, encourages new uh, investigators to uh, collaborate and start new initiatives. Um, and you can get more information about the study, um, public use data sets that you can you could access this afternoon if you wanted to, um, uh, and also the concept sheet process if you want to engage in the whole network of investigators uh, with the Max. And the, the website is listed there. So I'm happy to take questions. investigations of missing data or um, uses of existing data to better handle the missing data. Um, and, you know, again, I think it's sort of a nice spectrum, but I, one common theme is, again, sort of the careful thought that to handle missing data, you can't just sort of blindly throw some statistical package at it. Uh, you know, I once, just a little anecdote, I taught a little, like, one-day course on missing data, and one of the um, attendees sort of raised her hand and I was saying how the complete case isn't good, and one of my tenants raised her hand, and she was like, well, I just assume that when I run a regression in Stata, and I say, you know, reg, blah, 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 in Stata, that Stata, like, does something smart about the missingness. Um, and, you know, I think it's easy for us to sort of think that, yes, oh, well, the software should know what to do, but missing data especially is something that the software can't blindly, like, you really have to think about what are the causes of missingness why don't we have matches between, you know, why can't we link people? Why do people contribute less data? And it really requires a careful thought around, like, the scientific substantive context, and as well as using smart data. So you can't just sort of assume. And I think all three talks today have sort of given really thorough, nice examples of that. So sadly, you know, one lesson I think is you can't, <laughs> there's not going to be, like, a nice sort of easy, like, black box kind of thing. Um, that said, one question I did want to raise to, just to start some conversation is, you know, I think all of you sort of were focused on one particular variable, essentially, that had missingness that you were worried about. Um, did any of you, in the context, and this might be more relevant for Carrie and Derek, um, have to worry about missingness and other things? I mean, the EHR never has fully complete data. So if you could just talk about kind of the slightly broader context of missing data, not just on the sort of specific variables you talked about here, but how you thought about missing this more generally. So we actually, um, you know, this observation window thing has kind of gotten out of control for us because um, we now do the windows for like all the variables, not just the outcome, but the different exposures that we're looking at as well. So now you have to incorporate that into when an individual is under observation in a longitudinal study. So when a person enters your study and when a person exits your nested study um, has to take into account those observation windows. So we use algorithms of a minimum and a maximum using these dates to make sure that the person isn't just contributing person time when we think they're under observation for everything, but when we know they're under observation for everything. So. You know, that what I showed was kind of like step one, um, and then there's like step two and three and four when you start saying, well, let's look at myocardial infarction, and we know we've got to put diabetes in there and chronic kidney disease in there and all these diseases that work together, we want to look at those as well. So now we're starting to apply all the observation windows, one on top of another, to each individual to see when they're truly under observation for all of these things. So, so those are other ways that this kind of um, exponentially spirals, right, to, to try and make sure that you have um, appropriateness. And, and when you're dealing with large data, you know, everybody's like, oh, doesn't the signal just reach through the noise? And actually, it, it doesn't. <laughs> and we've seen that happen a number of times where we'll get a result and it's like, well, that has no face validity. 
in the general population or a population with HIV. And so you have to go back through and really think carefully because oftentimes when we don't see um, face validity, it has more to do with the design than it does the analysis, right? So if you're ever going to change your analysis the majority of the time, or if you're ever going to change your findings the majority of the time, you will be able to do so with change in the design more effectively than you will a change in the analysis. And actually, before we move to Derek, I want to follow up on one thing. Because you sort of offhand in your presentation mentioned smoking as, you know, and sort of I think it's useful to talk a little bit about, like, are there things that you just don't trust at all? And, you know, because that's what it seemed like you were saying was an example of something where it's so missing in some sense that right. we just don't even trust it. Right. And, and I think, you know, the other thing is, is you always have to ask yourself, like, maybe I can't answer this question in that data. And you have to just have that hard conversation before you get in so deep where you just feel like, oh, my God, I have to answer this question in the data. Um, you, you have to, you know, have your come to Jesus moment about that, right? And if the answer to that is no, like, stop. Find a new question or find new data, right? So I think that's really important to keep in mind. For things like smoking, we don't, we don't have good enough capture. And the reason why we say this too is I have the luxury of like, I've worked in the Max and the Wise, and they're actually contributors to the NA court, the way these clinical cohorts. So we can look at all the different studies and say, this is not the right question for this study. It needs to go to the Max or to the Wise, where they're asking questions about smoking every six months for 30 years, right? That's a great place to look at the, you know, smoking intensity and all that stuff. But in the NA court, if we're going to look at chronic disease, we need some marker of smoking as an adjustment, right? You can't publish a paper on myocardial infarction without accounting for smoking. It won't ever, you can't do it. So we do um, find different ways to try and get like an ever never as, it, it's crude, but it's shockingly effective in terms of just looking at the effects of that and, and creating um, some level of adjustment. And that's, you know, essentially scanning all the different sources we have to try and pull out if there's ever a mention that this person was a smoker. So it's like all these different levels and baby steps that we can get to. Um, also, it's recognizing that when you work in big collaborations, everything is a sub-analysis. Everything is a subgroup analysis because we actually don't have a single cohort that gives us everything we want, right? We, we put them together in different ways and it's all subgroup analysis. And so there are some cohorts that do give us BRO, patient reported outcomes. And so we can look at those groups and say, oh, look at the smoking patterns here and what do we think of that? And, and so that's another kind of area that, we, that we're moving to. But if, if I'm ever doing like a hardcore study of smoking, I, I wouldn't do it. I do it in the master, the wise, or something like a place where I, there's really strong measurement and little missing data. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. I don't know if you have more. Yeah, um, I, I would uh, uh, say that, that in my application, I, I was fortunate that there wasn't a great deal of missing data, mainly because we didn't include a lot of uh, uh, a lot of covariates. Um, the things that, that really determine whether someone started therapy or not were our load, CD4 cell count, uh, history of other ARTs, um, and that's th th those are variables that the Max does a very good job of. of, of of uh, collecting. Um, th there were other aspects of the analysis. We were looking at other markers of uh, kidney function, and that would be presence of pro protein in the urine. Um, and that's most valid from a first morning uh, urine uh, sample. And you could probably guess that there was a lot more missing data than the, the simple blood draw at the time. Um, so that was, again, a case where the outcome was, was missing. And we it, and it was secondary, so we we looked at it um, uh, as a as a sensitivity analysis, essentially using the complete case. Um, there were instances where, for some reason, the person's uh, weight wasn't measured. Um, we extrapolated that from previous uh, visits um, and a, as an estimate of body size, because we didn't think it would change that much. But we were prepared to use uh, multiple imputation methods if there were key uh, 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 covariates that were, that were missing um, that we needed to, to make sure that, that there was balance. But it, it just happened that it was fortunate in this application. Yeah. We were targeting something that the Max does a very good job of getting a lot of data on. Right. Well, getting back to you know, the value of 
lots of investment in getting the data to start with. <laughs> um, other questions? I, I have a question. So can you talk a little bit about how you figure out how to describe what the mechanism is that's causing missingness in your studies and how you know you have to think about that very early on in the process to make sure you have the data that you need to describe that. So so your question is how, how do you how do you you know sort of practically try to investigate the, the yeah, missingness? Yeah, I guess yeah. for yours making right. sure you have the right variables right. to do that. Um, inverse probability of censoring, making right. sure that you find those factors. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, it's they're, they're really, and Dr. Stewart can talk about this too, you know, they're not very ex exotic tools that you need to use. It's commonly just typical logistic regression where you uh, um, look at the association of key variables on its presence or absence in the data set um, so that you can get, oh, you know, this, this covariate seems to be strongly linked, covariate that we have data on, Seems to be strongly linked to uh, missing uh, m missing data. So, for example, in mine, it might be um, uh, viral load. D does that predict whether I drop out at my next visit? Um, and that's that's uh, we, we we try to operationalize it at least in that simple sense. And maybe even before you get to that point, you know, this is why we draw conceptual frameworks, right, and pictures, so we kind of have in our mind like these are the different things we want to look at because. Inevitably, there's going to be at some point where you're like, oh, I wish we could measure this because this is probably playing a role, but it, it's, it might not be measurable, right? Some constructs are really hard to measure. Oh, could we get a surrogate for it, you know, do something close to it? Um, if not, you know, what does this mean? Could we do on the back end sensitivity analyses to say if, if it would have an effect because the association with the outcome is X? you know, and look at how that could potentially change your overall estimate. So there are kind of back end things to do as well. I do a lot in the front end where it's like, okay, um, for some of the stuff that we do, it's like, it's screening, right? If there's differences in screening, like who gets screened for something and who doesn't, right? Because if it's care seeking behavior and it's physician decision making, you know, am I, am I seeing a, a difference in an outcome of a disease, an instance of a disease because there's just a population that's not getting screened for it as frequently. Those are the different things we have to keep in mind. And then um, sometimes we'll go to the different sites and we'll ask them, like, hey, do you, how often do you guys do this? I mean, we meet with our collaborators pretty regularly to get that feedback so we can kind of think through those mechanisms a little more carefully. Yeah, and I have a nice, that was a nice angle. And this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's slightly different from, from the other two presentations, but the way I kind of think about this is, um, you know, we, we in part undertook this study to, to understand what we didn't understand. Like, so how well the data merge process defined our outcome. Um, we didn't have a gold standard. We didn't have something we could compare to to say, like, okay, yeah, this worked really well or not. We need some additional information to assess that, and so I think um, you know, applying that lens to other studies might help you think about well, what are the things we need to look for to evaluate how well we measure things and, and, and think about how some of those things can be missing and how you need to um, do a little more work to, um, to measure them. So. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of these um, sort of, well, I called it clever, like sort of it's in these contexts, I think there's often a, also a concern like, well, when do you really need to worry about unobserved factors? And you know, and I think some of these approaches help you understand like, you know, how worried are you? And so my general take is for sort of worries about unobserved things. You know, right? Think about the theoretical framework, sort of conceptual framework, and then under like try to think through like how much of a problem do I really think this is in my context? So you know, in studies of depression, it's a big problem because people are really worried that depression status might be highly related to whether someone you know comes back for follow up. And so I think that's where thinking creatively around is there additional data I can collect? Is there a subset? Can I go talk to a subset of people? Can I go talk to clinicians? Can I you know just do a little bit of you know I think these are kind of some place where if you run it think about missing it very thoroughly, a great spot for like mixed methods work to sort of get a good, good handle on sort of what's happening. And I wonder if there's a class at 1.30. Um, so maybe we will, um, should I wrap up in case we need to get out of the room? I want to remind you of these nice um, schedule coming up. So um, 
Thank you to the speakers for um, three really great examples, um, and hopefully this will be useful to everyone.